So, we've got out of the office again this week, travelled all the way to London down to Trendy Shoreditch. And not only have we come all the way down here, we're going to travel back in time. The Alpine Club are one of the oldest traditions in British mountaineering and climbing. And we're going to visit it today with this new Vice President, Melanie Windridge, and she's going to show us around. So come with me and let's check it out. Hi, hey. Niall. Melanie, excellent. Come on in, welcome to the Alpine Club. Fab. Can I show, show you around? around? For sure you can. <gasps> wow. What's this we got? These are all the past presidents of the Alpine Club. No way. Huh. Yeah. Back to when? So it was, it was formed in 1857. Right. So this is the first president up here, John Ball. John Ball. And then they all get more recent oh. as you come along this way and then round into this part of the corridor as well. Can feel their eyes looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> what was it set up for? What was the idea of the Alpine Club? So back then in, in the 1850s, this was the golden age of mountaineering mm. and people were out in the Alps. British first people. Ascent. Yeah, lots of British Big, people. British climbers. Yeah, I okay. think it was it was a popular leisure activity yeah. for uh, people who had time and money. Yeah. So the Alpine Club was a gentleman's club that right. was set up to pursue mountaineering. I guess it's the oldest climbing club in the world. It is the oldest climbing club in the world. Oh wow, what a what a accolade! How many members all together? Uh, about one thousand five hundred oh, members in the Alpine wow, Club. Wow, it's quite a small club. Uh, because that's big. do you think that's pretty big? Yeah. Well, not compared to like the BMC, but it's a different, no. a different kind of organisation. We're part of the BMC. We're part of the BMC. <laughs> in the meantime, should we go and look at the, yeah, the library? This is the library. Come Excellent. and have a look. Excellent. Let's see it. Sweet. Wow, lots of old stuff here, isn't there? Yeah. So of course we've got um, lots of modern books on on climbing and mountaineering mm. and books from over the over the the decades, uh, but we've also got um, a heritage collection as well. So. When the Alpine Club started, formed, uh, they started producing something called the Alpine Journal. Mm. Actually, the, the earliest ones were called Peaks, Passes and Glaciers, but very quickly it became the Alpine Journal. Yeah, and this is a way for the membership to exchange information. So there are articles on, on exploratory climbs, new peaks, new routes, yeah. um, also science and arts. And That's the real value of the club, they collect all that stuff together and yeah, curate the information. Transfer of information amongst yeah. the membership before it was all on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now yeah. we're in the process of digitising them actually, so right. a lot of the Alpine journals are on the internet. What is this? It just takes you back, doesn't it? And it's, well, it's, it's a, a really important presence. library like yeah. for uh, mountaineers, if you if you want to find anything out about expeditions or routes yeah. or where people have been in the past, this is this is where you'd come huh. to find that out. Sure, sure. Any particular favourite books here yourself? Any? Well, there's gems one there's discovered? one thing I'd like to show you. So this relates to this relates to my interest of, in science and exploration, particularly science on Everest. So uh -huh. I've got together a few things today that I want to show you about science and Everest, and this. Goes, like, Your particular interest. It's my particular yeah, interest, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this goes right back to the beginning. So this is an old paper by uh, a man called Alexander, Ke Alexander Kellis. Mm. So he was a chemist um, working over 100 years ago. He actually died in 1921 on the first reconnaissance right. expedition to Mount right. Everest. And he was a member of the Alpine Club. He was a he was a Himalayan climber. In fact, he was a pioneering Himalayan climber. Like, so back in those days, they were still very much in the Alps. Kellis, when he died, probably had more Himalayan climbing experience than anybody else. Uh -huh. But also being a chemist, and he'd been working on oxygen, he realized, uh, or he had a really good understanding of the importance of acclimatization uh -huh. and the way that the body degraded at altitude. Uh, how did he know about that? How would that uh... Was that he, from going to the well, Alps he had experience of, of going up to higher altitude in the Himalayas, yeah. and so he'd seen how his body reacted and, and that of others. Mm. And he'd, he'd worked to try and understand why the body was getting less oxygen. Right. They knew about the air pressure yeah. reducing. And so he was thinking about what's happening inside the body that means that the body is, is receiving less oxygen to the muscles and to the cells. Mm. And so he made, he wrote this paper. And he made some really interesting predictions about whether or not Everest could be climbed without oxygen. Mm. And this was something that was very controversial at the time. And in fact, they didn't even like, know if Everest could be climbed 
the tool then. <laughs> this is the tool. you mean? As yeah. As opposed to climbing. Um, and he was an advocate of oxygen as well. Because he'd done this research into the physiology, he thought that oxygen would be necessary mm. to get up. But not completely necessary, but just would make it easier. So this is, a, this is actually called a consideration of the possibility of ascending Mount Everest. Right. So the thing about Everest is that it's not so much a climbing challenge as a physiological challenge. Yeah. Like the human body cannot survive at high altitude. And in fact, just by some quirk, the summit of Mount Everest is probably a, about the limit. And right. so it's marginal whether or not humans can even survive up there. Yeah. And so climbing Everest becomes a challenge of how do you keep the body alive and functioning well enough yeah. to get to the summit and get back up get back down again right. and so this is why like the science is so important so the alpine peaks and kind of climbing challenges in a way but this because of the extra altitude we've got a completely different uh, set yeah. of challenges the human kind of body is dying mm. it's literally dying yeah. above 8,000 meters we now call it the death zone yeah. because humans can't survive up there for long yeah. you just degrade really quickly mm. so you need to get up and you need to get out and so Kellis was thinking about these things he was he was thinking about like how can you keep the human body performing to enable us to get there. And so he sent this paper in to the Alpine Club. There's a lot of, so there are some letters and things. This, so this paper dates back to 1920. So he was right. working over hundred years ago yeah. on this. And he went off to India on an expedition, which then later went into the 1921 Everest reconnaissance right. expedition as well. He was invited to join that because of his expertise. But before he left, he'd written this paper. And he left this copy, this very copy here, here at the Alpine Club, and he left another copy at the Royal Geographical Society. This is the original nice. unpublished paper uh, that was left here at the Alpine Club when he went to India for his expedition. Yeah. The thing is, he never returned. Right. He died on the walk-in to Everest in 1921, and he never came back. And so this paper and the one in the Royal Geographical Society kind of got lost in the archives. Yeah. I mean, look at these maps, they're like hand-drawn. There was nobody there to, to look it. into it, to publish it. Yeah. And so the research kind of got lost, which is such a huge shame because he understood what was necessary to climb Mount Everest. If you read this paper, you can yeah, see yeah. that he understood what was necessary. Right, right. And nobody else at the time did. He Everyone was really else was ahead. thinking about thicker tweed. Yeah, they were thinking <laughs> about completely different things and yeah. they didn't even like oxygen because uh, it wasn't sporting or something. And so yeah. they put themselves, I believe, maybe a bit controversial, but I believe that like, they put themselves back decades mm. by not embracing the science. What's next? What's next? Downstairs, I've got some kit from the... Uh, oh, really? Yeah, from, oh, wow. from the 1953 expedition that oh. we can have a look at. Yeah, some Gore-Tex. No Gore-Tex yet. <laughs> I think, when did that come in? The 60s or something? Amazingly, the Alpine Club has an incredible archive of objects of great historical value for world mountaineering. Here's some in here. What have we got? Yeah, this is just uh, some of the stuff from the 1950s. So this is oxygen sets okay. from the 1950s. This set was taken to Everest in 1953. But this has actually been to the It didn't go Everest quite expedition. to the summit. It right. went to the south summit of Everest. Ah. And um, That's yeah. History. Yeah. And the Alpine Club has a lot of this because a lot of well, the people who were on the expedition in 1953 were members of the Alpine right, Club. Right. Many of them later became presidents of the Alpine Club actually. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we uh, we have a lot of historical heritage uh, right. items that get left to the club. I think what's interesting about about this is like that how how cumbersome the sets were back They're then, enormous. how bulky, yeah, how yeah, heavy. Yeah. They had to climb with these. Uh, of course, we have it quite oh, different we, now. As we pick one up and just want yeah, to get a sense yeah, of the yeah, weight of where these white gloves are, <laughs> such as the value of these objects. What weight are these? I don't know. <laughs> I know that no. one over there is nine and a half kilograms, which is quite a lot. Okay, yeah, this set weighs nine and a half. It's okay to pick these so, up. So, yeah, pick up gently. I really don't want to break it. <laughs> hmm. well, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. But that's bad without the tank. Oh, so the oxygen oh, really? cylinder would oh, be right, okay. attached Let's to that. Check this. That's probably quite heavy. <laughs> Well, okay, together that'd be quite a lot, right? And okay. sometimes they'd have two attached, and then they'd 
have some of their own personal gear as well. Yeah. So all in all, it could add up. So it was, must have been quite an argument to work out, is it worth carrying all this up the mountain? Well, this was Which the thing. Yeah, technology. in the earlier days, that was exactly the problem. So in the 20s and 30s, climbers thought that it wasn't worth taking oxygen because it was really heavy and they mm. said it didn't give them much benefit. And, and so actually work was needed to be done yeah, to, to make things lighter. In fact, I think Sandy Irvine in the 20s did some tinkering to, to make them lighter. And I know that in the, the 53 expedition, the cutting edge, trying to, we've got to get the top of the mountain, they used two completely different uh, technologies, uh, closed circuit and open circuit. It's almost yes. like a, a Betamax <laughs> and a VHS sort of thing, completely yeah. never see. So They didn't know which was the best design yeah. at the time. The open circuit was, like more like longer established if you like and it's a simpler mm. set and in fact it's the set that we still use today the open circuit and what that means is that you just breathe the oxygen in through the mask and then when you exhale all the exhaled breath just goes to the air goes to the atmosphere it's just wasted um, but there's still oxygen in that exhaled yes. breath so the point of the closed circuit was to try and recycle some of that oxygen so make the whole set more efficient so they actually scrub oxygen, sorry, they scrub carbon dioxide out of the exhaled air. Right, clothing, right. so uh, we're going to send you to the summit of the, the world, the highest point on, on Earth. It's pretty cold up there, uh, it's a pretty extreme environment, so we've made you this windproof smock, <laughs> Mr. Smile. This, <laughs> this is from the 30s. Amazing. This, this is, is from the 90s. amazing, it's just this tiny little piece of cotton. Well, it's really interesting because we don't realise this, like people who are born nowadays and just have all this stuff, yeah. don't realise that a hundred years ago, it, it didn't exist. We didn't have Gore-Tex for waterproofs. Waterproof stuff is really hard to come by. Yeah. The best they had was this, which is really windproof, uh -huh. but it's not waterproof. Um, down clothing didn't exist. The concept just wasn't there. It just wasn't there. What did they, what did they uh, matter in Irvine? I've got a picture of those guys in tweed. Yes. Uh, they say that um, they actually would have worn something like this for climbing. Mm. Sometimes they used to have to keep up appearances for photographs. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wear, their, wear their best jackets. Yeah. Harrison um, Coves and <laughs> sponsored them. The problem is that when they were, well, when they were climbing, it was fine because you're warming up. But as soon as you stop, the heat just Whoa, you just lose it really climbing. quickly. So they'd yeah. be really cold, and and in their tents and at night, they didn't have the insulation. Mm. And actually. Um, George Finch, who we mentioned before, <laughs> um, he was a pioneering. Like, he was one of those people who just like thought about the problem yeah. and thought about the solutions. Yeah. And he was the first person to take down on an expedition right. to um, would to have Everest. been used for blankets before the efforts. Well, I think I think they may have started using it in sleeping bags. Right. Um, I can't remember exactly when they they started using it, but he had his own Finch had his own down clothing made. He made mm. a, a jacket. Uh, and some and some trousers, and it was actually encased that the down feathers were encased in balloon fabric because that was quite a lightweight mm, like a fabric that he that they knew of. Um, but so he took it in 1922, and everyone else thought he was crazy. Yeah. They all laughed at him until he got higher in the mountain, right? <laughs> and then he was warm, and everyone else was cold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think Ooh, there's sorry. <laughs> there's something in his down in his diary where he writes something like they're not laughing anymore or something like that. Everyone's envious of my down clothing. So, uh, but this, so this was really innovative and they didn't use it again, actually, until the 50s. This was from the 1930s. Now, I just want to say, uh, F.S. Smythe. Frank I used to read his books, Frank Smythe, and yeah. then sort of getting into climbing. It's so amazing now that that's his, I don't know. That's his a, jacket. It's a whole uh, heritage thing. It's just amazing yeah. there that he wore those things. And, uh, he, he, yeah, he cool. wore these things. And, um, and these were the down uh, trousers of Tom Bordelon. So the person who took that oxygen set that we were just looking mm. at up to the summit, yeah. um, well, to the south summit, these are his little booties as well. He's got his name on them. Oh, it's on. his mum stitched them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fab stuff. Uh, you've referred a couple of times to your own experience of Everest. Uh, it'd be really nice to hear a bit more about that. Of course. We have to sit down and have a yeah. chat about that.